name is Edwin. Um, I'm from Dare to be Grey and the website you can find here online. Um, please check it out during the presentation even. Um, I'm just one of a small team of three and um, coincidence has it that one of my other teammates is actually here as a co-host as well, uh, Hannah. Um, although she's here on a, with a different cap on for the rest of the presentation, showing her research, which I'm also very excited about. Um, but talking about Dare to be Grey, um, who are we? We are a organization that identifies as both a campaign, a platform, a movement. It's somewhere in between. Um, and our goal is kind of um, two, two angles. On the one hand, it's raising awareness on polarization. Polarization is a very complex, but yet very important phenomenon at the moment. And has very and has a lot of different layers, um, but it's determining our society in a lot of ways at the moment. So our idea is that by raising awareness, we're already in one step ahead. But we also want to offer an alternative. It's one thing to raise awareness on an issue, uh, but it's a completely different thing to actually try to be part of the solution. Um, and that's what we try to do. And we always balance these two uh, missions. I can tell you very shortly about our idea on polarization. I would highly encourage you, if you're more interested in it, to go to our website um, and check our online manual on polarization in which we go much, much more in depth. Um, but for now, the preview, I will um, explain to you that polarization is, we would define it as this process of increasing us versus them divisions. It's this big society-wide process that is very much connected to this human urge of um, thinking in groups um, in terms of us versus them and forming these in and out group identities. It's, it's a fundamental part of human nature, so to see. And even if you look at history, polarization, you can, you can find it everywhere. Um, that's not to say, of course, that today we don't face unique modern challenges. Um, one thing that we at Dare to be Grey really want to emphasize in our definition of polarization and in observing the problem is the importance of narratives and stories. Narratives are kind of the, the storylines of ideology. They are the thing that connects all these separate incidents that you see in the background together and you can see that it's this bigger social trend. Why is it important to know the importance of narratives in polarization? Um, because it teaches us two things. On the one hand, it shows us that um, um, it, it makes us understand polarization in a different way, because knowing how important narratives are, you can actually see how important social pillars of our society, like the media or politics or social media platforms, um, propel these narratives and propel these stories um, and give them attention. It's attention to these narratives that's key in understanding what polarization is. However, it also shows us that storytelling and online campaigning should be part of the solution if we want to fix polarization worldwide. Of course, we can't ignore social policies and um, social media platforms and their regulations or policies, uh, etc., that all have an influence, but stories are key to it as well. And that's why we present Dare to be Grey as the platform as it is. This online platform for the grey middle grounds to show um, that we don't have to pick all the time between absolute extremes of black and white of us versus them. And that the grey in that sense is this new nuanced and open for diversity uh, middle grounds um, in which we kind of promote these pro-democratic and pro-diversity values. Um, it's also important that we challenge people to get out of their bubble. Uh, and as such, we kind of always have in our narrative the balance between promoting values, but always challenging people to do something with it, to refocus your attention, to burst your bubble and speak out about important issues. Um, you know, that's, that's the narrative that's behind all of these stories. And then the question, of course, is how do you do that with online campaigning? Well, first, we have our own website where we place a lot of our content and we have a lot of different stories that we tackle. We have 
videos, uh, video interviews, uh, photo series, we have long reads, we have opinion articles, we have very informative posts on checking fake news or disinformation or how you can prevent hate speech. Um, and these by itself can make very interesting stories, but then of course the next step, and maybe that's also where our Q&A session will be about today, is how are we going to promote that on Facebook? Um, we, as Dare to be Grey, we've been doing it now for over four years, so it's very hard for me to immediately pick the lessons learned or specific cases. We've experimented with a wide range of things from direct videos to simple quotes to promoting Facebook groups. Um, one, a couple of lessons learned from that um, and that we always try to find is that um, you always need to be aware of the formats um, that you're using. Each platform kind of demands their own way of stylizing. Visuals, aesthetics, they are important on almost every platform. You can have written a story as good as you like it, but if it doesn't have any catching visuals, you will probably not get much attention from it through social media. Timing is also very important. Um, when something is a hot topic in the news, you almost always see that making a link between your story and that news item will almost definitely work. Um, be careful of your headlines. It kind of clickbait by itself maybe uh, may not be the best practice out there, but you know, make turn it into a question, turn it into uh, this call of here you're gonna read something good and something interesting and leave it open for interpretation. Um, and you know, try to reach the right audience per article. I can remember that from the keynote that Aaron gave, there there are these layers of um, audiences that organizations can have. And we as that's great definitely fits into the largest circle that she presented of a broad social audience. But that doesn't mean that there are sub audiences as well. Even though our mission is society wide, uh, we can make stories about the LGBT movement. We can make stories that are tailored to policymakers. We can tell stories on Ireland or on Christianity. And then each of those stories kind of have their own audience to begin with. So it's not just this organization has this audience. There's this much bigger web going on. Um, one last example that I, I want to share is that we have made an effort trying to actually burst those bubble, bubbles, for example, by hosting a um, very on a very divisive topic, a new kind of dialogue. And we reached out to both ends of the spectrum through Facebook ads, actually managed to get a lot of engagement over 12% um, and get a lot of comments over 1500. But was, even though it was one of the most divisive topics out there, it managed to get over 1500 comments. And we had to monitor it barely when it came to hate speech. Uh, so that's a very interesting case that we have and we hope to uh, utilize much more. Um, and seeing that I'm already on my 10 minutes, it, I think it just also kind of proves on how much there is to cover um, and how much there is to talk about. And therefore, I would definitely like to open the floor for questions, either join the stage or say it in chat. Um, and maybe we can tailor it to whatever people want to hear about it. I must say I really admire your your project and when I heard for the first time about this Facebook post which made such an enormous impact I felt like wow that that's that's really a campaign so I'm going to let now Irina and Besnik Leka I mean I can already start um, answering it why did I um, why did I decide to start this initiative um, it was very much coming from a social wide context. We were initially part of a competition actually hosted by Facebook. That's over almost five years ago now. And um, we were challenged in that competition, a group of 20 students back then, to create a campaign that tries to combat extremism and radicalization. And as a student group in the Netherlands, we kind of made the observation it was, it was the beginning of 2016, so it was just after 
the kind of rise of ISIS and that whole debate going on and people afraid of radicalization in um, in local context or traveling to Syria. And we observe that, um, that, that discussion, that debate, and we felt that there was something more going on with extremism and radicalization in the background. And that was polarization, this alienation and this sharpening of two narratives that are forcing people to kind of um, join forces. So it was from that invitation in this competition to make a campaign on extremism and radicalization that we decided we wanted to address polarization instead because we believe that's one of the key things that's behind extremism and at the same time is also the root cause of many other social issues we're facing today both in the Netherlands and outside of the Netherlands that I think still holds true to that day so we really outgrew those roots of um, being in the field of counter extremism and radicalization I mean you, you only need you know um, the examples of the US ever since uh, and the UK and the Brexit referendum that kind of show how much polarization is influencing society um, nowadays everywhere. And in the meantime, Edwin, I would like to ask you, you say we, what do you mean by we? How many of you are there? It's four years long project or yes. some backgrounds before? Have you uh, met each other before? How did you meet? We the, the group started with 20 students who were, were um, which was kind of created by the professor who actually joined the competition. So back then we were really a student initiative. Um, that was for the first half year, so that's been a while now. And then it was me and uh, my colleague, uh, Jordi actually, who's also present today, <laughs> somewhere in detention, who decided to continue these efforts and professionalize it after we graduated. Um, and now for almost a year, if I'm not mistaken, if it's not slightly more, Hannah also joined the team. Uh, so all of it, what we're doing is mostly the three of us um, organizing it. We have a lot of partners. We have uh, designers that we work with. We have other writers. We have guest speakers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's mostly the three of us creating a lot of stories, not all of them, um, but also facil uh, facilitating the platform itself. Great. Great. And the last time, the last uh, possibility to have a question to Edwin. Thanks for there are only time. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks and praising is also, you know. Yeah, welcome. I mean, it's it's you know, it's it's a quick show and tell session. And I'm also very excited to see the other ones. But um, if people want to know more, and you know, it's one thing to tell about stories that we make. It's a completely different thing to just look at the stories. So I would definitely highly invite everyone to go to our websites, um, read the stories that we have on, on people, but also look at the manual in which we really analyze all different facets of polarization. Since um, we are no longer sharing the presentation, could you please type the website on the chat session? Yeah. And in the meantime, I would invite Marco and, oh, Emir already did, to, to come to me. Yes. Emir and Marco, can you? Just show yeah. your presentation yeah. now. Maybe um, you have some comments more to Edwin's work. I have a comment. Edwin, thank you very much. I think you have an amazing website. It's very nice looking and it's very interesting in terms of uh, content. This is uh, because we have several projects where we create content. I know that it's really difficult to do and to gain this quality is really amazing. For those who still didn't go there, use your chance to check it. It's amazing. <laughs> nice job. I, I already planned my weekend for all of this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Edwin, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you for now. Thank and you. And I'm really excited to see what Marco and Emir have to tell us. Don't go so far. <laughs> Don't give up. Um, okay. I'm trying so, to... Yeah, Hanya left us. So <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, we have this question section, so uh, if you have a question, don't hesitate to type it in uh, any second that you want. And as we have not much time, we will try to be short, and uh, but still we will try to um, make all of the points that we wanted to speak about. So today, me and Marco, we will speak about the Skepsis movement. 
uh, which is uh, you put it. No, it's not in reverse. It's the way our logo looks like. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so we will speak about uh, skepsis movement. And um, to begin speaking uh, about it, we need to speak about ourselves. So Marco, please click. Marco is a clicker today. Yeah, yeah. Marco, do you want to say a bit about ourselves? Uh, yeah, so there's uh, four main points uh, we have, but one of them, it's actually where we're coming from. Uh, originally, we are coming from Crimea. Uh, and wait, probably... wait a second. I have a question for our audience. Uh, do you know what is Crimea? And if you do, please type a plus or yes in the chat section. Marco, please continue. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, so this is uh, important for our movement. And um, yeah, we uh, both uh, was engaged in uh, NGO and uh, in uh, youth work and activism ba uh, back in uh, our place. Yeah, and Emir, maybe you can continue. Yeah, so and uh, also like around uh, seven years ago, we started an uh, NGO which is called Logos. And we do a lot of activities connected with young people and with youth workers as well. So uh, this is our background and click Marco. So, yeah, how it all started. So, if you know a little bit about, uh, so Crimea is a peninsula in Ukraine. I see that half of the people know about Crimea, half of the people don't. So, Crimea is a part of Ukraine which is currently occupied by Russia. And it happened in 2014. And uh, there was a lot of events happening in Ukraine, including occupation of Crimea, war in Ukraine. And uh, when it all started, we, uh, we had Ukrainian society, Ukraine as a country, and we personally had to deal with a lot of propaganda, fakes, and disinformation. For example, Marco has a babushka. If you don't know what is a babushka, it's yeah, a yeah. Russian, Russian grandma, yeah, who is very prone to believing uh, to Russian news and prone to spreading uh, some fake news. And, um, and uh, what was the problem is because of this propaganda, fakes, and disinformation, uh, I think we we thought that this is part of the reason why uh, there was a war. This is part of the reason why this all started. And uh, then when it started, Marco Click. Yeah, uh, I also will. Uh, that, uh, it's also uh, affect all our friends, our families, because uh, basically people receiving information from different sources have different opinions, and it's also was uh, like a lot of uh, like uh, family, they, like small conflicts on this topic. Uh, that's why it was. We feel so unfair and so cheated when uh, it's like mass, mass propaganda machine working and just brainwashing you. So we was really like, oh no, we need to do something about yeah. it. Yeah. So we had this question: Why is it happening? And then uh, me and Marco, we thought that uh, we have a huge problem. And saying we, we, we meant like the whole society and most the young people with critical thinking and media literacy. And uh, what does it mean is that uh, because people cannot evaluate information in a proper way and because they cannot uh, evaluate the media in a proper way, they tend to believe to fakes, they tend to spread fakes, they tend to believe propaganda, and they tend to take propaganda as uh, for granted. And uh, then uh, we had this like little conversation with Marco and we will uh, play it now in roles. Yeah? So, <laughs> Marco. Uh, actually, this was this was a real uh, conversation. So I had this like uh, question. So ah uh, no, you start, Marco. I think it was your. It's uh, to find uh, government and a huge propaganda budget. Yeah. yeah, and then I say like, but Marco, we need and we can do something. Yeah, let's start the movement or some project, whatever. Yeah, and uh, Marco always brings a lot of uh, crazy ideas, and then I say like, uh, what do you mean by saying movement? Like what? Yeah, like an idea, like uh, let's see how people was fighting for their rights in India, in uh, America, in, um, in Europe, this note hate speech movement, etc. So let's do something like this. But yeah. we actually had a problem. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <No. laughs> yeah we, we didn't have any knowledge, like uh, expertise and advanced knowledge on uh, critical thinking, media literacy, and especially how to run campaigns back this time. So, but we knew that we have a really nice tools and we have potential and the people we're working with, uh, basically young people. Uh, so we had an idea. Let's do a youth exchange. So really simple one mobility action. When we gather people uh, from Eastern Partnership country, also from Europe, and let's talk about it with them. And we did it. 
Uh, so we had this possibility to to get actually two use exchanges approved on the topic of critical thinking without actually being expert on this topic. And young people give us an idea what this might be about. They designed the logo, they designed the branding, they started Facebook page, Instagram page. We talk about a lot of interesting topics and we actually had the possibility also to talk with the experts and we framed an idea what this movement can be about and what is necessary to do for this target. Yeah, so um, why it was important for us not to do it ourselves only, not to create the name and all of the things, because there is important thing about, and we will speak a little bit about it later, about ownership. We didn't want to be owners of the movement because if you know any movements, the one that Marco spoke about, like India, independence movement, civil rights movement, and so on, they had uh, some important figures uh, like Gandhi or uh, Martin Luther King uh, in the, uh, who were leading these movements, but uh, at the same time they were supported by a lot of people. So we wanted to gain this support and we wanted to gain this ownership from young people and youth workers. And um, yeah, so we started doing this and Marco? Yeah, so this is basically a Facebook page which was uh, designed by young people like literally from zero. And uh, uh, it's, it was a, it's a small step. Let's just make something, uh, some nice posts, some nice information, some nice researches, and upload it uh, in the beginning in English because it was just easier uh, to uh, people to follow and to see information. But uh, the, how it's turned uh, later, we had the possibility to work on this idea more, to implement a more uh, international uh, local activities. And we find out that we have a, a huge knowledge hub about how we can actually educate young people on topic and critical thinking. And every time it was recorded and collected in a way how it can be used for educational purposes. And uh, now we have a Google Drive. It's in our web page, logos.ngo. We have a lot of folders with ready prepared scenarios for different activities which might be implemented actually now not only for young people, but as well for adults. Kahoot quests, training courses for seven days, for one day, uh, video, posters, Instagrams, games, uh, quests, a lot of different interesting things which might be used and we actually use it and every day when we implement an activities and people have possibility to contribute and especially on recent fakes or recent topics which are relevant now in our society now we're fighting I guess uh, against um, mis misinformation about COVID and terror it's all there so this is what we encourage people to to use it take do it with your family with your friends in school whatever yeah and uh also yeah so the skepsis movement is a movement uh, which has the goal of developing critical thinking and media literacy and uh i saw today already i think this is like the third time i uh we mentioned critical thinking and media literacy on this uh, event only because i think edin spoke about that and uh mateo i think spoke about that and uh edwin spoke about it as well so this is very like hot topic uh what we do marco can you put the next slide yeah. yeah so what we do now we don't only run the facebook page actually the facebook page let's say it's not the most important thing of uh of uh, what happens within the movement i think what is the most important thing is the international activities training courses and news exchanges that we do and why it's important because we don't only uh approach like random people in the internet or outside we work with youth workers I think like most of uh, the people who are here and uh, we deliver some knowledge to them and we expect them to have a greater impact when they go back to their local communities, when they go back to their target audience. So uh, for two years that we are running this movement, we had, around, uh, we had 11 international projects, training courses and news exchanges. And um, our partners, as you see on this map, come from 26 countries and we had already projects within Skepsis Movement implemented in this, uh, yeah, it's less than 11 because in some countries we had several projects. Uh, so yeah, and uh, additionally to that, we also do some local activities. 
We have workshops, we have uh, events, for example, in uh, Poznan, in Poland, we are doing various kinds of events, starting from uh, uh, basic workshops on cognitive biases and logical fallacies, ending up with uh, a combination of Spanish uh, language lessons with critical thinking. And uh, we try to involve also people on the local level as well. What is your yeah, what we learned. I, I think, Marco, we are almost out of time, so we should be very fast. Yeah, but this is the most important, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we will go very fast. It's not as easy as it seems. Uh, people tend to speak about their successes, and uh, but they don't speak about their failures. And uh, there is a special cognitive bias about that, uh, survivorship bias. If you want to read it, you can read about it later. It's super difficult. and. Um, the next point is coming from that is that people and partners, they're important. It's uh, really difficult to start a movement or make a big campaign if you are only two or three people. It's much easier you have, if you have reliable partners and uh, people who support the idea. And uh, what's important also is that uh, you should be persistent and believe in your ideas because quite often it will uh, turn out that you will feel like uh it's difficult no one supports us uh no one uh we don't know where to where to go but uh if you believe in your idea it's it it works i mean it worked for many people what also we learn out of it that uh whatever you do and especially on these topics on the fighting fake news and critical thinking you'll have people who supporting you and follow and say hey you're doing amazing job made the nice comments and actually uh try to support you but also there is the haters who uh basically uh when we do some um some research based on uh, i don't know that uh some i don't know crazy medicine might help you to fight covid uh, and people actually believe on it so much and they actually uh putting uh like uh, yeah Maybe. They will call you crazy for saying that 5G, 5G doesn't uh, spread coronavirus. You know, they exactly. will say that, that you are crazy. So, and, uh, yeah, please, Mark. Yeah, we learn that uh, you need to do what you believe on and uh, and keep doing it. Also, what we found out that was really important for us is that we have a shared responsibility. That uh, we have, uh, of course, we have a like a skepticism Moon coordinator, and our organization is basically trying to uh, to encourage people to do it. But in the end, people are doing it themselves. They have materials, they have support from us, but it's their their idea. It's it's it goes there, yes. which is actually linked to a second point that it's not a project. It's not a project which we run. It's an idea. Uh, so uh, our goal is that. In, when, we, when we stop to do it, the idea will go anyway. That uh, people uh, continue to educate each other on the topic on critical thinking. They uh, talk about media literacy the, by using these materials and developing them more and more. I think, Marco, we have Kat Katarzyna. Do I pronounce correctly? Katarzyna. Katarzyna. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So uh, you have a question. If you can, This way we are First starting of all, our I questions really appreciate answers. your work. Yes, thank you. Um, mm, I have a, only one question because um, um, I am sure that is a really, really important job, especially in your area. But um, how is your method to work with uh, partners? Because you told a lot of, about the uh, work with partners, but what kind of partners or what kind of rela relationship you made? Mm -hmm. Okay, as there is... Uh, um, Who is the partner? Of yeah, yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Our, our organization is actually quite uh, a lot involved in the uh, Erasmus Plus program. So we had the possibility to, and we actually built a huge network around Europe and Middle East as well as uh, Eastern Partnership, when uh, organizations are willing to learn about this topic and they're willing to join our projects as uh, co-beneficiaries. So when we do in international uh, activities on use exchanges, uh, people are willing to join, come and learn because it's also uh, funded. Uh, another partners we have, it's uh, uh, people who actually have a knowledge about critical thinking or mental health from local community, from here, from Poznan, for example, when I operate, and they wish to do something, but they don't have a possibility. 
And uh, for example, we had we had amazing change uh, uh, um, chance to do an open event in this Saturday about mental health with local psychologist, which for free would like to share your knowledge on this important topic in a bit crazy time. So this is a partnership because yeah, um, yeah mostly. Can I also add, Marco? So uh, what we also, how we work with partners, we offer them support in terms of the content and materials that we prepare. As Marco said, we had a lot of prepared, like for example, if you want to deliver a workshop about critical thinking, or if you want to deliver some, let's say leaflets about like how to start your critical thinking or media literacy journey. We have that already and we are ready to give it to you. Now we have this idea and uh, soon we will start it that uh, we have this uh, solidarity project running in uh, Poznan and we are ready to help uh, partner organizations to write their own solidarity project on the critical thinking topic. Uh, and we actually have the application form which is can be adjusted and used for the other organizations. and. Uh, we will be sharing it with the partners with those who are interested to uh, to have a bigger impact to have them realize their own local projects on critical on delivering knowledge about critical thinking and media literacy so this is part of that okay. thank you very much you're welcome if someone else has questions you can write them down or you can uh, jump in and ask them please jump <laughs> in the meantime, I would like to again invite Magda, who is our artist here and who is uh, describing in her own way, graphical way, what is happening here. These drawings are amazing. Um, by the way, while we, we are waiting, do we have still some like couple of minutes, Hanya? Of course. While we wait for questions. Uh, while we wait for questions, um, as we went deep into this uh, critical thinking and media literacy topic, uh, we actually started one more, let's say, quite big project, which is oriented on Russian-speaking uh, audience and Russian-speaking youth, which is called Fake Detox. And I will send you the links later. As far as I know, now parallel to our session, there is a session about TikTok. So those of you who wanted to attend TikTok but didn't, uh, I will send you a link to our TikTok uh, page and uh, there we make short videos in Russian language, so maybe not all of you will understand it, but you can just check how it works. And uh, we have uh, this project where we debunk fakes, where we uh, deliver knowledge about critical thinking and media literacy, and we do it on several platforms, uh, TikTok and Instagram. I will share those links, but also on some other as well. And this is also a result of the Skepsis Movement campaign um, and uh, let's say our, some kind of outcomes out of it. Great. I'm happy you added this. And you also referred to some links. So if you could just paste them to the chat. I then... right now because I prepared them in advance. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. He so... was waiting for this moment all, all day. <laughs> I was waiting for this all day. <laughs> I'm waiting for my weekend to dig in all of this. Uh, and in the meantime, this is the moment when there is the last chance to have the comment live on or ask a question being here on the stage. And in the same, on the same time, I would like to ask Hannah to uh, come to, 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 to share her video and audio. Thank you. So I'm letting Hannah in and waiting for another Hi. question, comment. So maybe Hannah, how did you find this presentation? It was really interesting, really nice to, um, see the work that you do and also um i'm next going to be presenting some research um and it was interesting to see that um quite a lot of the stuff the things that we found align with the stuff that you're doing as well which is nice yeah okay. uh, you had amazing research i i didn't read it all i just read some parts of it it's really cool ah, i'm waiting to share <laughs> you have to catch up with 77 pages quite quite sorry uh, 177 pages. Oh, yes. There is a summary, though. <laughs> the summary is 34. It's also quite challenging. <laughs> it is quite quite long, quite extensive. It's very elaborate and great job done. So, guys, thank you so much. In the thank end, you. I will, uh, again, bring you all to the stage. But now 
I'm going to leave Hannah on her own. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting the Game Changer Research Report. Um, so the report was created in order to look at the current state of thinking on a number of topics such as radicalization, CVE, extremist narratives, and counter and alternative narratives. Um, we felt it was necessary to look at these topics so that we could distill relevant knowledge that would be useful for training and development and campaigning in the future. Um, by looking at a vast number of campaigns, what the industry has learned through resources and toolkits, and uh, also conducting three different roundtables with experts in the field, we were able to get a better understanding of what's worked, what hasn't, and why. And from this, we uh, formulated our own conclusions and recommendations for what is necessary to create a successful, effective, and impactful campaign. Um, so before going through our recommendations, um, I'm just going to explain the three different chapters a little bit more. Uh, so chapter one is where the bulk of the research lies. Uh, in order to understand what makes an effective and successful campaign, we looked at over 100 different campaigns and programs, primarily just in Europe, but also some across the world. Um, we looked at the successes and the evaluation of each campaign, um, but often the only method of evaluation for the campaigns was looking at a number, the number of views on a video or the number of likes or followers on a social media platform. So sometimes the ability to note the success of each and every campaign was quite limited. We also try to categorize the campaigns as best as possible, for example, under youth campaigns, educational campaigns and disinformation campaigns. What we found uh, a lot of the time was that a campaign fit into more than just one category, however, so we created this campaign crossover table to see the overlap. Um, it's really important to note that while these campaigns can be used to see how to build a successful campaign or also how not to in some cases, um, the campaigns can only really be used as an inspiration. Uh, a campaign should be highly relevant to its own target audience and target goals. So when creating your own campaign, the circumstances are unlikely to be the same as the campaigns displayed in this research. Um, I want to show you a quick video example of a campaign that we considered very successful. So I'm just going to take off my video so you can see it a little bit better. Germany's right wing scene has more than 25,000 members. And this figure is on the rise. Once you're stuck in the marshes of right wingism, it's hard to get back out. Right wingers put their members under enormous pressure. When you're merely a small donation backed initiative like Exit Deutschland, how do you manage to generate attention among right wingers and the general public for your theme? Get out of the scene. The answer is with some fabric and a little help from a disuse. We produce 250 t shirts for Exit bearing the slogan Hardcore Rebels, National and Free. We used an assumed identity to supply them to the organizer of Europe's biggest right wing rock festival, who then distributed shirts among festival goers. A surprise then awaited the rightists back home. The t-shirts have been primed with a print that washed off. After just one wash, they said, if your t-shirt can do it, so can you. We can help you to get free of right wing extremism. Exit Deutschland. The right wingers have got the message and been duped. Quite right too. The enraged commentaries across their networks alone were enough to propagate the name Exit throughout the right wing scene. The media fell over themselves to report on the Trojan t-shirt coup. More than 300 newspapers ran articles worldwide. There was primetime television coverage. Neo-Nazis were rocking at a concert. Eines NPD rock festivals. Hardcore rebels. Die nie Trojaner funktionieren. Fahr der braune Dreck ab und die Überraschung groß. If your t-shirt can do it, you can do it too. Exit Deutschland. Page impressions ran to 1.2 million on the websites of Der Spiegel and Süddeutsche Zeitung alone. And we achieved more than 30 million gross contacts on Facebook. The result was that the Trojan t-shirt was the German number one social media hit in 2011 and that amassed a cross media value of around half a million euros in German print and TV media alone. But most importantly of all, the number of right wingers who now want to get out of the scene with the help of exit has tripled since the campaign began. Sorry, neo-Nazis. Thank you, Odysseus. Peace. Um, so I think that campaign pretty much speaks for itself and shows how successful it is. And I can see some comments in the chat agreeing with me. Um, so through the creation and the distribution of the T-shirts, Exit Deutschland successfully used an offline strategy to move people to their online campaign. Um, 
So on to chapter two of the research. Uh, the summaries in this chapter give you an overview of some of the most prominent reports in the field uh, in the hopes that it will improve your knowledge and your understanding on the topics without having to necessarily read all of the other reports in detail because they are quite extensive. Um, I won't go into the different resources just now. You can take a look for yourself. Um, but this leads on to our final chapter. Um, as the experts that we had at the round tables all confirmed the current thinking that um, we found in chapter two. So we use these round table discussions with experts in the field to help identify the necessary components for formulating a successful campaign. So they were pretty vital when producing the conclusion and recommendations of the report. Um, just quickly looking at some of the key takeaways at the round tables. Uh, in Brussels, the experts told us to be wary of the new trend of disinformation that is rising, which is clearly something that we've seen during the pandemic, um, and also to focus campaigns on local communities. Uh, in London, the discussion highlighted the importance of measurements, be it with the right audience, long-term measurements, or short-term measurements of a campaign. Finally, uh, an important takeaway that we found from the Hague Roundtable was the need to build up youth-led campaigns through providing agency and flexibility for youth and taking a step back to allow them to communicate with each other by themselves. So this brings me to the conclusion and recommendations. Uh, the research led to us creating a systematic model that leads to the building of stronger campaigns and provides a pathway for organizations to follow. We recommend creating a campaign by following the, um, the elements listed on the slide in order. Uh, we suggest starting with target audience when building a campaign as it's vital and the understanding of it is essential. Influencers are next as they will help you build your campaign and target the correct audience. The third ele element is defining a clear aim of your campaign. Campaigns with multiple aims won't be very effective. In terms of counter-radicalization, uh, we found that campaigns that aim to de-radicalize will also not be effective as they require one-to-one -one interventions, so that's a little bit harder to do. Uh, for element four, narratives, we recommend that using a positive alternative narrative is the most successful type of narrative. Clear goals and actions will ensure clarity of your campaign and risks are essential to know what could go wrong and how to fix it before you actually start a campaign. Um, and I heard Erin touch on calls to action earlier in her keynote speech. Um, these are essential as they aim to create behavioral change, which is the central focus of every successful campaign. They should drive engagement both on and offline. And lastly, uh, measurement is essential, uh, but it must come with a baseline and an understanding of what is being measured from the get-go. Both immediate measurement and engagement, as well as long-term, are needed to ensure a successful, effective, and impactful campaign. Um, so that's it really. Uh, the research uh, is now available on the Game Changer website under the Build a Campaign section. I'll post the link in a second. Um, there's a full version as well as a summary, um, which we just discussed before, which have a lot less campaigns and resources because it is quite extensive. Um, so any questions? It's definitely quite extensive because it's an amazing, amazing job. Thank you, Hannah, for this. Thank you. So now I have a tricky question to you guys. Have you done it right according to recommendations of Hannah? <laughs> Not everything. <laughs> but I think there are a lot of them. It <laughs> was Poland. I checked all, all uh, um, campaigns was done in Poland and the search was described. Sorry, I, I didn't quite hear you. I check everything related to Poland in this report. Oh, okay. Yes. Nice. I, think, uh, I think it's amazing. Um, the, the outcomes, they're quite amazing. Um, for us, for example, it was a little bit difficult to concentrate on some specific target audience. We have the target audience of young people in European countries, mm -hmm. and maybe not only Europe, and they are mostly English speaking, though we had some other languages involved as well. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think it's I, I think it's a very good point about call to action. Uh, this is what this is our I think uh, point of growth that we yeah. need to do. Definitely, and I know Edwin follows most of them. <laughs> well, we one no thing that me and what, what was also definitely a, a lesson learned from the things that you mentioned and also what triggered my my thought was the the aim slash the target audience. Maybe it actually correlates with the, the problem here stated is that we initially 
Um, our target audience of our main Facebook page was just Dutch, actually. Like 90% of our activities was aimed at the Dutch audience, so we got a lot of Dutch followers. And the minute we wanted to broaden our horizon, because also our mission does have this broader potential, the minute we started doing it and making English content, talking about international problems, it fell flat on our Dutch platform. And we and it was like this this process of learning that we kind of later on realized, okay, let's make a completely separate account, separate accounts for that to be great with the international stories and the English stories because we or you know I'm Dutch I like international stories but a lot of other Dutch people don't yeah. or, or they don't read English a lot so I, I thought the two audiences correlate a lot but they didn't that that's what we learned from experience so now I have we now have kind of two separate platforms one for a specific Dutch audience and one for an international and sometimes the stories overlap and we translate but a lot of times they don't Edwin, I think everyone knows that Dutch people come from another planet, right? I have a question for you. So you, I think you went through like million of different campaigns. What was the most, the smartest one? Because I think the, the idea with the t-shirt, it's super yeah. smart. Well, that was, which, so we, which one, the, the, the smartest one that you came to, except of maybe the t-shirt one? Um, so we actually picked five um, that we liked the best basically um and so it was that one um that i showed you and then also um shout out uk created music video um i think one of you mentioned that mateo was potentially that was the same mateo who spoke earlier i think he's speaking at some point this week um isd um created a one-to-one -one online program so although i did mention that um, we don't recommend that. They did it very, very well. Um, and of course, Exit Deutschland. Um, and then we also looked at Price on Our Lives social movement campaign, um, which was the one in America. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it um, after some of the shootings there, the school shootings. Um, and then also Receive Sport Club organ donor, oh, sorry, organ donor card. Um, so they're all listed in the research. They're all really, really great campaigns, had really great strategies, clear target audiences, and um, ended up uh, a lot of them going viral as well. I think the Price on Our Lives and the Receive Sports Club one definitely did. So, yeah. And uh, uh, so to continue this question, like, uh, do many of them actually continue being active now? Or they have like this some exact goal, they achieve it and then they stop? <laughs> Um, I think it varies really. Um, they're definitely all still accessible. You can still find them all online. Um, I assume a, a lot of the time it's down to funding though and specific projects. Um, so that that results in potentially campaigns ending. I think this is also quite um, quite often it's a big problem about the funding because. Yes. Uh, <laughs> It turns out that uh, it's difficult to run something without um, without proper funding. And uh, I think if you speak about the movements and campaigns which we want to have on the uh, long term, it's also important to remember about funding because yeah. it's, it's hard to get people involved uh, like and making like, I don't know, Edwin, I think you must have some kind of funding as well because it's hard to make this kind of content on like just on a volunteer basis. and you need to devote a lot of time and efforts to it. And if you do not get at least like pay for people who do it, it will go down very fast. So, and I think there is also this problem uh, with, um, I don't know, it's a problem or not that you some kind of, uh, not rely, but you depend maybe also on the time. So this is a, a yeah. Yeah. part. On the other it. hand, you, Emir and Marco, you, just presented the story the story it was like storytelling honestly like two years ago you just came out with the idea yeah, yeah. let's do something about this that, that was guys. exactly how it worked <laughs> so i guess the funding was not you know your source yeah but, the beginning. I mean, the but uh to keep it on professional level and keep it visually nice and make it mm -hmm. uh a standard design, you know, that uh, nice written and uh, also do research on uh, some specific topics. It's actually a lot of effort to request expertise. So then it's, then it's professional already. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, young people during workshops, they produce nice materials, but they need 
editing work after it anyway to be able to publish or post it. And, and actually, we are always looking for funding for Skepsis Movement as well, because it's uh, this is like an ongoing uh, thing. If we uh, uh, if you don't find funding for this uh, for the movement to support the movement, then uh, we look for the funding from organizations and uh, like from partners, from ourselves sometimes. So yeah, uh, it starts like I mean you can always it's easy to start the initiative when you have a lot of like you know this motivation and you have a lot of this euphoria. But then if you do not make it, if you want to have it like long term running, long running, then you have to have something to support it. If you have a short term, like five months campaign, six months campaign, maybe it's a little bit easier, though it's also quite often needs some kind of financial support, at least to produce the materials. Like, I mean, even the video that kind of should, I mean, you need to buy these t-shirts. Yes, you mean you need to print yeah. t-shirts for some kind of money. Yeah. You need to get those money from some. You need to make this video, and it's like super cool, edited, and I know that it costs money too. So yeah, and uh, this is this is part yeah, of yeah. I mean, for me, that's a very recognizable story, Mir. I mean, that's exactly how our process went. We started out as a students' initiative with like 20, 21 people. Um, and then the first half year, you have that momentum, and even afterwards, people wanted to continue. But then, at one point or another, life kicks in. You know, you have to you have to pay you rent. Money. You have to, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. you know, you never do it for like commercial ends and trying to make profit and enrich yourself because then you're definitely in the wrong sector. Um, but at one point, you need to, to to pay rent for it. And you know, the the group of twenty students and volunteers shrunk down to two who kind of gambled at that moment in, in, in our lives to, to do it. And it took us a year to get to a place where we have funding. I believe that you are all describing the experience, which is quite uh, well known uh, to our audience. We, yeah. have, <laughs> <laughs> we have 15 other people here behind their cameras. so. Please, dear participants, if you would like to show your face and share your audio and just come here and, you know, share with us your experience on campaigns. We have here very professional guests. So it's time just, you know, it's a good opportunity to talk to, to people who already had this path uh, walked through. Um, By the way, uh, when you say about the professional uh, yeah. professional set campaigns, this is a good question. If it's possible to be a professional at campaigns, I mean, uh, I think most of us are somehow connected to NGO sector to to this kind of area. I think the professional campaigners are uh, working in marketing mostly. In Coca Cola, yeah. In, in Nike, Nike, Coca Cola, yes, uh, and these kind of companies because they make like huge and well, they have huge budgets. But they like uh, if you notice know uh, the film director David Flin Fincher, uh, he mm -hmm. directed uh, Fight Club and uh, Gun Girl and a lot of movies. Uh, he also actually directed a lot of commercials. So, and they were like, they had the huge campaigns with um, Nike, they had campaigns with uh, Levi's, I think. And uh, like, if you can invite David Fincher to film something for you, then uh, your campaign gains a big boost <laughs> in terms of uh, people getting to know it and, uh, yeah. 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 By I by calling you a professional, I meant you know appreciating your work and that you are effective. Yeah. Uh, but this is a, also the good question. So, do you believe that if somebody is making you know a teenager is making a campaign uh, through Instagram or TikTok and is reaching to let's say his their class, so twenty five maximum thirty people. Is it an effective campaign? Well, that's going to depend on what their target audience is. If their target audience is the their class, then absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> an effective campaign does not need to be a campaign that has to go viral as long as you're reaching their target audience. But it can accidentally go like also there is like the means of your campaign. For example, I think all of you know Greta Thunberg, right? Mm. She's a teen and she did like she just I think found out a very cool way to do what she is doing, and she became like super, super influential, and she brought this message and idea to like 
really high level of discussion, which is amazing. Yeah, I, I have a question to you, Hannah. Have it, your research was based on also on Ukrainian campaigns. So how was the how big was the range of localizations? Like, have you were you also checking, you know, the out of the EU borders campaigns? Yes. Oh, yeah. So it was mainly uh, Europe focused, um, just because that's what Game Changer is more European mm -hmm. focused. Um, but there were some really amazing campaigns um, in America, um, the Price on Our Lives campaign is in America, um, also South America, the the organ donor card, I believe, is Brazilian. I don't remember exactly. Um, so majority were European focused, um, but I, I did look at some of the others as well because it's nice to see what they're doing on the other side of the globe as well. <laughs> and then, uh, so I have this question also to you, like, um, because we can come back, as we have some time now, we can go back to your in presentation and to this post that became like super viral the first time you showed us at rehearsals i was like wow i know that it's <laughs> it, it's it's actually not so easy to get like this kind of huge reach and uh involvement of audience at facebook even though there are like millions of millions of people most of them don't do anything they just as erin said in the beginning they passively scroll through the things um what do you think what was the why it worked um, well, to start, I think with every success or fail that you have as an organization, it's always kind of this gamble to immediately see like what worked or what not. I think like, you know, you need a lot of research <laughs> to, to, to understand that and to so many more layers. But my gut feeling tells me in that is that usually when things go become very popular and the engagement rates of certain policies jump out of the roof it usually is a combination of um i think the timing is the most important one are you talking about a topic that's dominating the news cycle that's a very sad thing i think to remark but it was something about black pete which is i, I won't go into the topic right now but it's like one of the most polarized right. specific debates in the netherlands um and everyone knows because it's about this returning christmas tradition the moment you start talking about it in end of october and november everyone is going to respond to it basically um so that helped and i think then it's a combination with visuals first and then how the title is connected to um what you're actually writing and then number four or maybe number one a lot of luck i guess as well <laughs> um, but, I mean, we did it, and it's, it's, I think it's one of the most proudest achievements of what we do, and we try to reiterate it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's less so. But, yeah, why specifically it was this case? I think it's just like so many things that might go viral or not. It, it has to do with like specific timing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, why, did you choose, your thoughts. why did you choose Facebook exactly as your main uh, platform? um on the one hand it's really ironic it's when we started in 2016 everyone was on facebook including our generation so it's only later that it kind of moved away um but in between there we still kind of made the conscious decision that our content is most fit for it on the one hand because we offer we moved much more to in-depth articles and videos and all, all that sort of stuff and a lot of newsy long read things are mostly promoted on Facebook. Plus, audience-wise, it's still, as I mentioned in previous sessions, it's still one of the biggest platforms out there. And we, as the FDPA, never necessarily had a big emphasis on youth in our, um, which is, I think, a big, big factor. Youth wasn't our specific target audience. Um, because in the end, polarization is such a society-wide thing. And when you look at statistics of who's spreading disinformation or falling to fake news and stuff like that, it's, most statistics say it's, not so much the young people as the older ones. It's that bizarre. No, it depends. I mean, um, I think uh, I think like what we, in, we we dealt with is that we see that <laughs> when the informational field around you is totally controlled by, let's say, government, like for example, as in Russia, then uh, people 
uh, people gain very little amount of information out of this like uh, out of this context which is created by the government and the propaganda uh, channels so even if they have access to the internet and to different uh, points of view they somehow go to uh, to go to the sites that they're go to the news that their babushkas are listening you know, mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, there is a strong power of uh, whatsapp and viber uh, messages do you know this like kind of epidemic in uh, russia and ukraine this is like one of the huge sources of information uh when a message is being like sent and resent like one million times and recently we had this uh, fake debunked about um so the message was like this uh, attention attention it's very urgent scientists from germany found out that uh, covid19 is not really a virus but a bacteria and uh, this is uh, supported uh, with the and it makes your blood thick and uh, you need to take aspirin and la 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 la, la. and it's like my aunt sent it to me but i know that the younger people are also like resending it because and also for some one of the reasons is because there is no reliable information out there where they can take and get what they need for example about covid19 so Hirieta, who wasn't able to connect with us uh just types the question she wants to hear the smartest idea from you <laughs> so i'm just uh, reading it loud we are at ymca in kosovo and we have an innovation hub here where young people come with different ideas and campaign and i was interested to know your opinion for the best way to organize a campaign for young people 14 to 18 age so what do you think will be the best way for them to understand what we want to show Um, I would say perhaps to take a look at the research report and the campaigns that we looked at in that, um, as I mentioned before, they are all, sh they should be used as inspiration. Uh, you shouldn't copy any specific campaign because your target audience is different from any of the ones that we looked at. Um, but you can take a look at them for some ideas um, to build your own campaign. Probably. I yeah. have just a question to Hirieta, maybe you can comment. Uh, do you want to involve young people? Uh, like, do you want to have more young people involved into your activities or you want to organize young people whom you have already to make some kind of a campaign? That because if be you want to involve young people, it's one thing, but if you want, if you have some young people and you want them to run a campaign, I think the best way to do is not to intervene too much <laughs> because young people usually make up much better ideas than let's say than we do elder. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 32 so i think people 14 to 18 they have much better ideas than me yeah i would definitely support that like uplift maybe people who are already part of young young people of the same age uplift them to become the creators and support them if they have questions on software or whatever maybe they understand software already better most of the time um facilitate them help them and, and and make way for their ideas i think that's the crux a lot of times do you remember when you were 14 till 18 what crazy think, ideas you were coming up with i think i still have uh, dvds that were just new then DVDs. I think we had VHS uh, was uh, the <laughs> new thing when I was 14. <laughs> so Hirieta is answering yes, that she them. is thinking about the campaign, how to involve them. Yeah. So I think uh, the uh, like, I think most of the stuff now is going on online. And I think if you want to involve young people, you have to have other young people who can support you and give ideas because it's really hard to understand people of that age if you are much older than them i mean uh, uh, when i started working with tiktok like uh, for example yeah. me and marco we are developing this idea of creating an account in, in tiktok where we would make like short videos about fakes and critical thinking so we installed tiktok like for two days mm -hmm. and we were like just researching like how it works 
and like after two days, like I deleted the app and <laughs> much better because they thought like it's it doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah, it's crazy. Then, like, it's, it's, it's it's trash. Really, yeah, it's trash. But then Why? when um I mean it's trash when you first look at it. Later we reinstalled and I have TikTok now. It's actually a super cool network, and if you don't use it, you should go there because young people they are there and actually kids are there starting from like seven years old. They are in TikTok. I mean at least here. And um uh, it's 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 hard to understand, but there is some there are some laws there and some logic that goes, uh, for example, in TikTok in uh, the way they the ideas are spread there. Uh, there are there are some things which are which seem to be super interesting for those for that age, which are which make completely no sense for us. You know? That's that's the thing, and that's I think always this is the problem about campaigns uh, which are direct to the people who are of different age or different target group yeah. than you because you think you know them but it can turn out that you know nothing like you know nothing Johnson you know and uh, because like uh, I mean if you have younger brothers or sisters you can ask them or if you have kids you can like see that it, it it's really hard yeah and maybe like you know I, I read that you're from you have your own YMCA in Kosovo like if you want, I would maybe even say, if you want to get such a campaign online starting, approach individuals and youngsters in person, and maybe you know some who are creative, um, either because they, they write or they are active on social media or they film or they take photos or whatever, um, approach them in person, maybe provide them with resources and then maybe see where the creativity leads them. And I think one of the things that we can also discuss now as we start this discussion about uh, the campaigns and uh, how they work and don't, uh, there, we must have courage sometimes to drop this campaign if we see that it doesn't work and we like don't need to make everyone suffer trying to make it work. Yeah, and it's about the mistakes. <laughs> especially yourself, you know, because uh, you spend like, because we have like here 80 or 150 people who are super into this work like NGO work youth work and we are super motivated and we do we spend a lot of efforts and you want to make something for young people and it doesn't work but you keep pushing hard you keep doing some stuff and it doesn't work then maybe you just have to drop it and start the other way because like uh, it's people a relief can... also to hear it because nobody is really I've, I believe that in NGO and activists, you know, environments, it's very rare to hear that you can actually drop something and you don't have yeah. to push for it. You know, I think one of the biggest problems, if uh, if you speak about campaigns, NGO work, youth work, is people they're like burning out. They're burning out very fast. They uh, start uh, like start doing some stuff they start doing very energetic and active work and then you see that if they don't do it a little bit more professional they drop it like and so, and you can there are different ways of dropping stuff right you can drop it in a nice and beautiful way or you can drop it like this you send an email to the partner with whom you worked and it turns out that she just closed the organization because they don't know what to do next so yeah <laughs> We touch, <laughs> we touch the subject, which is, you know, very, um, I would say, up, up, uh, up to date through COVID, right? Also, and that, and this is what happened with COVID. Um, a lot of the people, like when the COVID started, for example, I can give you an example of logos. We started looking for online things to do, but we see that a lot of the partners which relied only on local activities or international, let's say, training courses, use exchanges, they do nothing now. And they do nothing for like almost a year. And if you're an NGO and you do nothing for a year, uh, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to restart. And, and, it's, and now with the campaigns that we speak about, like Edwin's campaign, and the Dare to be Green, not Edwin's, but the, the one that you spoke about and the one that we speak about, they have the online, um, let's say, segment in it. And it's, it's what can support it running but if you're on, only connected to offline then it might be difficult are there any questions or comments from our audience maybe somebody would like to share your experience 
of campaigning or at least sending the right message somewhere on a professional slash unprofessional level because that was the discussion what means professional campaign yeah Hirieta, thanks Emir okay so this is last moment of our uh, last minutes of our session so I just would like you to maybe sum up if you could just finish with one sentence what we should really remember from this session from you I know you made it on slides on the last slide but now I would like to ask you to to just say it in one summing up sentence what is there as a recommendation or as a as a thought to for participants to stay with Um, I can start. Uh, well, first of all, please read my research. Um, yes. <laughs> Weekend. <laughs> um, and yeah, follow our model, our recommendations, um, and make sure to always remember about your target audience. Thanks. Marco? I will, I will add that uh, do as I think you believe in and also if or on something, for example, um, what, what you also have a base, basic knowledge or you would like to get this knowledge. Because quite often I had this um, kind of conversation with people who would like to start some campaign, say, let's do education for people about, I don't know, ecology uh, and invite someone to do it. But what is your role then? Uh, get yourself the skills. Uh, get aware about this topic and do yourself. Believe on it and be uh, be involved. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and then then it will work. You know when you'll be patient about it. Cool. Thank you, Edwin. Um, very hard to follow on those. I would definitely. I mean, the, the the lessons learned from Emir Marcus' presentation at the end and Hannah's um, eight points. They I think they captured all honestly all of it. Um, and definitely, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe I think that be great. <laughs> and embrace, um, yeah. Don't be afraid to embrace what you're already good at. I think many people they want to completely reinvent the wheel or do something completely different. But start with yourself. I think that that's a very good one. Thank you. And Emil. I, think I, I spoke a lot in this like uh, <laughs> session. <laughs> I just wanted now? to say that uh, I think the second part of our uh, session was about uh, the difficulties and the problems and the funding and uh, dropping. But uh, I think we, I would like to say that if any of people who are listening to us uh, have some idea and you don't know if you should do it or not, uh, just try. I mean, again, Greta Thunberg, she was just coming out to the square with a poster, you know. It's, it's super simple, it's nothing difficult, and it worked. So you can do something very amazing with very simple things.